Thank you all for attending today. Dr. Rice. Thank you, Scott. Welcome to the Michigan Department of Education's Comprehensive History Instruction Webinar Series. Today, we are fortunate to have an exceptional presenter to discuss the labor rights movement. This session offers educators greater depth of knowledge about the organization of workers to collectively take action to improve working conditions and wages, establish safety regulations and worker benefits, and give workers a voice in companies and industries. This series will explore the impact that the movement has had on Michigan and our country. This is the eighth topic in a series that the department is offering associated with a comprehensive teaching of US and world history. As educators, we have the responsibility to teach the full breadth of history, including about difficult and challenging subjects such as race, racism, sexism, and xenophobia. As searing as some of our history is, we have a responsibility to teach it all to our children. This broad effort will help you as educators learn more about historical movements, events, and peoples that are part of the complex, diverse history of our country and world, and by extension, help you explore the same comprehensive history with your students. We are grateful for our presenter today, Dr. Jorge Chinea, Professor and Academic Director of the Center for Latin and Latin American Studies at Wayne State University. Dr. Chinea specializes in colonial Latin American history and has researched the themes of immigration, settlement, and colonial exploitation of the Hispanic Caribbean. His writing has received Wayne State University's Board of Governors Faculty Recognition Award. Additionally, he is a former resident scholar of the U.S. Library of Congress and former contributing editor for the Handbook of Latin American Studies. Each unique session in this webinar series will focus on the history of the labor rights movement. This will include discussion on and around Manifest Destiny and its effects, Latin American labor migration, education, and the revolving door migration experience. Thanks to Dr. Chinea for sharing his expertise and assisting in the growth of knowledge and understanding among our educators. Thanks to the education organizations whose partnership in an era of attempts to narrow curriculum and encourage subject and book banning is inspiring in and of itself. I want to thank the Teaching Comprehensive History webinar series team for its continued efforts in organizing these spaces for us to meet and learn, and to Dr. Nino Rodriguez, longtime friend and colleague, for his recommendation of Dr. Chinea. Finally, I'd like to thank you, our attendees, for your courage, your interest, and your conviction. Enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Koenig, and I am a social studies consultant with the Michigan Department of Education. We're thrilled to have all of you in attendance as we continue the Comprehensive History webinar series. Before I turn over the presentation to today's presenter, I have some housekeeping announcements. Participants' video, audio, and chat features have been turned off. Questions for our presenter may be added using the Q&A feature. Questions will be addressed toward the end of this event, if time permits. If time does not permit, questions will be addressed through email. We will provide links to resources using the chat feature throughout today's presentation. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Teaching Comprehensive History website. If you would like sketches for attending today, please be sure to sign in on the sketches link that will be provided on several occasions in the chat during this presentation. You can adjust your speaker view options anytime by selecting the view button at the top right of the Zoom window. At the conclusion of the webinar today, a survey will be emailed to participants. Please share your feedback as it helps us to inform future webinars. Closed captioning and an American Sign Language interpreter have been provided. If closed captioning isn't automatically visible, select the show subtitle option. Your interpreter for today is Candace Barrier. Now, without further delay, please welcome Dr. Jorge Chinea. Dr. Chinea's specialization in colonial Latin American history makes him a sought after content expert to learn from. He has researched or lectured across the globe and has been recognized by many distinguished organizations for his work. It is an honor to be working and learning from you today, Dr. Chinea. Welcome. 
Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Dr. Rice. I want to thank Nino. I want to uh, thank Reina and everyone else behind the Teaching Comprehensive History webinar series in putting it together, assembling the information, recruiting speakers, and so on. I also want to thank um, ahead of time the participants of this series because I know that you are also interested in getting some additional information that will make your job uh, more um, fulfilling and also more diverse in terms of the coverage of the information that is being provided uh, to the uh, students who attend public schools in the state of Michigan. I wanna start by uh, saying that uh, the preface of this uh, presentation, um, I prefaced it the way I did because I thought it was important uh, that we glance back uh, at the development of the Latino population in the United States before we get into the subject of labor, although labor has been a central component of the experience of people of Latino descent in the Americas. Let me start by saying that this uh, presence of Latinos in the United States is yearly recognized in the National Hispanic Heritage Month, which takes place every, every year between September 15 and October 15. The dates uh, were selected uh, because in part, because on those days, several countries in Central and South America became independent, including Mexico, who declared its independence in September 16. Uh, this particular celebration that is done annually was started in 1968 by Lyndon B. Johnson as a weekly uh, heritage program. In 1988, President Reagan extended it to a month-long celebration. Uh, the following year, George Bush made it a national celebration. These presidential initiatives came also at the behest of Latino, Latina leaders in Congress on both sides of the aisle. So, who, you know, how should we, and I'm sure many of you are thinking about this, how should we refer to the people that we constantly hear in the media, on the TV, on, on the radio programs, even in books that we read, referred to as Hispanic, Latino, and even the term Latinx. Uh, I think it's important to uh, note that all of them, all of those three labels are ethnonisms that are being used by people for many, many years, uh, some in more recent times, uh, to define individuals or groups without central roots in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, in the past, that area was known as Spanish America, and before that, uh, the Americas, and named by the native peoples that lived here for possibly 10 to 20,000 years before the, the Spaniards set foot in the new world. Unfortunately, a lot of these terms, there are a lot of terms that are being used, that are being used in a de derogatory or demeaning way. These are ethnic slurs, and they're offering her a members of these groups as a way to put them down or to belittle them. And there are many examples that you can think of like speaks, greasers, and wetbacks. Those are the terms that we don't want to use, obviously, in teaching about students except to call attention to their existence so that we can stop repeating them or not use them in the future. Members of majority groups often employ some of these very same ethnonisms to my left of the screen uh, as a way to bring attention to individuals who perceive similar or cultural traits into an umbrella category. In other words, in order to make it easier to say, you know, this block of people or this segment of the US population is Latino or Hispanic or Latinx. The term Hispanic was actually not a term used by the people themselves. Uh, it was actually used by the US Census Bureau as a way to agglomerate or congregate uh, these different 
ethnic groups into that umbrella category, as I mentioned before. Latino has been used to some extent uh, in the United States because the area south of the border from the Caribbean down to Tierra del Fuego in Chile is li literally known as Latin America. So some people felt that maybe the people from Latin America ought to be called Latinos or Latinas. Um, so it's a term of choice. The, one of the first times that it was used in the United States was in the 1920s, um, when an organization, a civil rights organization evolved in Texas. It was named LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. And that organization still exists. Um, some of these labels are also a form of self-identification used by certain individuals or people to describe themselves. And this usage is often accompanied or followed by qualifiers indicating a preferred or secondary identity. And what that means is if somebody says, hey, are you Latino? I say, yes, I am a Latino who is Puerto Rican. Um, so these terms are larger categories. They're not used as such in Latin America. You, you're not gonna be able to find many people in Puerto Rico calling themselves Latinos. The same thing in Mexico. So these categories are somewhat social construction that were developed in the United States to define or categorize these various groups. Altogether, there are about 20 to 22 national groups that fall under those labels. People from Colombia, from Chile, Bolivia, Cuba, and so on and so forth. And not all of these groups are the same, obviously, right? They live in different latitudes. Uh, their country has different weather patterns. Um, they have, may have been colonized by Spain at different points. They previously may have had large Indian populations. Some of them received more or less influence of African groups. Some of them received less or more influx of people from Asia. And some of them also had invited at different points in their history, individuals from Europe, Italians, Germans, Portuguese, and so on. So a lot of these countries have a lot of different mixtures. Uh, so while we define it easily with Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, there's a lot of diversity behind those labels. So how did these people come about, right? How did they become part of this North American landscape? Well, the easier answer to that question is to say that when the Spaniards, starting in the 16th century, venture out in search for a route to Asia, they bump into this area that we now call the New World. And as a result of that encounter, they began exploring, later colonizing, and ultimately they began to settle the area. And some of the North American landscape was part of that. There are numbers of Spanish explorers, including some people from Africa that came with them and Native Americans who joined them, who spread out in search of El Dorado, searching for the mountain of youth, or plainly seeking new lands and resources such as gold and silver, and they look everywhere in, in the Americas, including North America. And many of the states that are now part of the United States were initially named by them. Nevada, which means the snowy state. That's the Spanish word, Nevada, means a state that's under the snow, under a lot of snow. Montana, a state that is qualified as such because it's mountainous. Colorado, which means red or red clay in this case, which has to do with the silt of the Mississippi River washing down towards the Atlantic and carrying that red color with it. So a lot of people thought that maybe Colorado was an appropriate name 
Texas, which means tiles in Spanish, uh, named like that because the terrain in Texas in the summer looked like tiles on the ground. Uh, California was named after the word Calif, um, which means a kingdom or a community in the Arabic uh, culture. Uh, many of the Spaniards who came to the New World um, uh, came from places in Spain that were under Islamic or Muslim influence and control for about 800 years prior to 1492 when Colombo sailed off looking for that route to Asia. And so consequently, they carry a lot of the uh, Arabic influence with them. So California was named after that. And then Florida or the flower state uh, was named because at least for the European eyes, it looked like the area was very florid, very, uh, it had a beautiful fauna and flora and people I guess they were looking for this new world with an Eden, Garden of Eden quality. And they found that Florida sort of reminded them of that. And even today, we feel that way, right? A lot of people go to Florida because they're looking for a warm, cozy place close to the sun uh, to enjoy their uh, retirement years and also to visit and, and to enjoy time there. And there are many cities that were named uh, in the continental United States by Spaniards, El Paso, which means the path, San Francisco, named after one of the um, regular orders in Spain, the Franciscans, San Antonio, one of the saints, and San Agustin, another one also known as St. Augustine in modern day. Uh, and then after the Spaniards were here for approximately 100 years, uh, all the Europeans began to find their way to the America, including the French and the English, and later the Dutch and the Danish, and all of them carved out colonies in the Americas. Uh, most of the Dutch and Danish colonies were on the Caribbean, although there was a handful at the northern coast of South America, whereas the French and the English, they tended to focus much more in Central America, the Caribbean, and parts of North America. And so they too left their imprint in, in this particular area. So consequently, you can imagine that Latinos were part of an already diverse group of Europeans and Native Americans and later Africans who carved out or developed new societies in, in in what is now called the United States. And you can see that in this map, right? You see to the left side of my, of my screen, the 13 colonies that were originally organized by England. And then to the west of that, you begin to see the settlement that was uh, agreed upon uh, with the British after the American Revolution so that the uh, 13 colonies would be able to expand westward. And then the Louisiana Purchase will come in later on in the beginning of the, of the 19th century. And by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the United States will annex a good portion of what was then uh, New Spain, which eventually became uh, Mexico after the independence of that country in 1810, but the Mexican government had not been able to fully settle much of that northern region with, with the exception of California, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and so on. So the United States in, in the middle of the 19th century acquired this area to the southern part of that picture of the uh, continental United States, you see New Orleans, which during the Spanish era was called West Florida. And then West Florida and East Florida were both part of, of the Spanish empire also, uh, along with the former colonies of Mexico and further south in Central America. That the United States also acquired Florida around that time 
which means that in all of those regions that I just pointed out, there were already Latinos living there. In fact, some Latinos in that area or in those areas often tell me when I meet with them, when I visit parts of the Southwest and the Southeast, they say, we never crossed the border to enter the United States. We were here already. The border crossed us. And it's kind of an interesting way of looking at things that Latinos don't, from those areas don't see themselves as immigrants. They see themselves as the original settlers of those areas that were later incorporated into the continental United States. Uh, here you have an example of one of the early settlers from the Spanish side. This is Juan Rodriguez. And of course, he's not there in that picture. <laughs> It's just an image of a, a street uh, sign on Broadway that was named after him. Uh, Juan Rodriguez was one of the first non-Europeans uh, who settled what is now called New York City. Uh, he did that in 1613, which will be about 20, maybe 15 years before it became New Amsterdam and ultimately New York City. Uh, he came from Santo Domingo or Hispaniola, as the Spanish call the area. It's an island that's today divided between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Uh, in that time, it was only the Spanish who occupied the island. And so the island was colonized in the latter part of the 15th century by the Spaniards. And by the 1613, uh, that, that was already a, a lengthy period of time. So by that time, Af enslaved Africans have been brought in uh, from the continent there, along with uh, Black uh, settlers from the southern part of Spain that already lived in Spain. And so consequently, there was already a Black presence in Hispaniola at that time. Juan Rodriguez was a, what we might call today, a Black Dominican. Uh, he traded with Native Americans, learned his, their language, and eventually he became the first Latino in New York City uh, the first Dominican, the first African American, the first immigrant, and the first merchant. That, according to the New York City Council, who passed the, the resolution to name that section of Broadway after him. Uh, this is a Dutch document that I found on the internet that documents Juan Rodriguez's presence in that area. I cannot read it um, because I don't speak Dutch, but if this was in Spanish, I could probably take a stab at it and try to decipher as much of it as possible. Um, so how did that population expand over time? Well, the territory that was annexed already had a native Hispanic population. Uh, they had different identities even then though. Uh, for example, in California, the Hispanic population was known as Californios. You know, they, they used the, the territory as part of their identity. In New Mexico, they were known as Hispanos, which is the Spanish word of Hispanics. Um, and many of them saw themselves, and even today, as uh, descendants of Spaniards. And they still had traditions in New Mexico that go back to the Spanish days. In California, it was a little different because there was a native, strong native population, and that native population blended in with the Spanish population, creating a whole new culture of mixed people. Arizona, Colorado, Texas, all of those regions also has some degree of interracial mixture as a result of miscegenation, and, and other um, social forces that created new groups in, in those areas. After the territory was occupied though, they, the United States began developing it. I didn't put that on the screen, but labor will become a central component of that development, right? Because you need to develop mines, 
you're developing railroads, and you're developing commercial agriculture. Those are the three major industries that were developed in the U.S. Southwest, and the labor needed to accomplish that was not available internally in the United States. And so a lot of that labor came from South America, Central America, but a lot of them came from Mexico. So consequently, free immigration from Mexico, uh, much of it, if not most of it, uh, um, welcome in the United States occurred between 1848 all the way to the beginning of the 20th century. After the Spanish-American War of 1898, the Amer Spanish-American War was a military conflict between the United States and Spain, um, in which Spain occupied Cuba. The Cubans wanted their independence. The United States intervenes supposedly to help the Cubans gain their independence, but the United States ended up interested in the island. And so that created a conflict with the Cubans that generated an, an independence war. Uh, and when the war ended, uh, the United States still occupied the territory, but in a conflictual situation. So in 1902, the United States released Cuba, but created a protectorate over the island so that it could maintain its political, economic, and strategic interests in that area of the Americas. The United States also acquired the Philippines, which is part of Spain, but that area, like Cuba, was difficult to retain. Eventually, a series of independent clashes, independence clashes occurred, culminating in the formal independence of the Philippines in 1946. The US also occupied Puerto Rico, in 1898, extended limited US citizenship with the Jones Act of 1917. Um, and thereafter, all Puerto Ricans born in the island became US citizens. That allowed Puerto Ricans to migrate. The very first migration of Puerto Ricans to the mainland United States uh, occurred in the 1900s, but not to stay, but rather to go on to Hawaii, where the sugar industry was being developed. So early on, the presence of Lat Latinos in the United States was molded, shaped by the need for labor in the United States as to develop from an agricultural society during the uh, 13 colonies phase into an industrial giant in the course of the 18 and 19 centuries. And that needed a lot of labor. So labor started flowing northward, enhancing uh, the economy with this precious resource, but at the same time, increasing the presence of Latinos in the, in the North American landscape. And so Puerto Rican consequently, after migrating to Hawaii, many of them decided to come back to the mainland and settled in California, which became one of the earliest Puerto Rican colonias or settlements in the United States. And then in the 1920s, as a result of the Jones Act and the granting of US citizenship, Puerto Ricans began to migrate in greater numbers uh, to a number of cities in, in, in the United States particularly uh, uh, Illinois, uh, New York, Philadelphia, New Jersey, Florida, and so on and so forth. Today, there are 6 million Puerto Ricans living in the United States, uh, which is twice as many as the numbers of Puerto Ricans living on the island. And so the Puerto Ricans can be said to be almost like a, a divided or um, a dual uh, identity, right? You have the Puerto Ricans living in the United States who are embedded in the culture and society and the marketplace here. And then you get the Puerto Ricans living on the island uh, 
following much of the same theme, but from an insular perspective. And you can see on this screen how that population has grown. And not all of this is necessarily immigration. Although when some people look at this, the first reaction is to say, wow, they keep coming. They're engaging on a, I don't know, they taking over or this is a new colonization process. But in fact, a lot of this is natural growth. Simple, right? Is people essentially through natural reproduction uh, increasing the population. Um, what drives this is two major factors. One is that Latinos tend to be younger than most Americans. In fact, uh, they are the youngest ethnic group at the moment in the United States. The second factor is when you have younger populations, you have high fertility rates. A high fertility rate means higher numbers of births. And that means an increase in population. And so not only do you have immigration flows driven by labor needs in the North, but also you have natural reproduction and demographic patterns taking place in the continental United States. Uh, the Latino population has been engaged in all facets of, of the American society, especially the military. At one point in Puerto Rico, I remember reading this when I was in college, 40% of the population was in one way or the other connected to the military. In other words, a lot of the occupations in Puerto Rico um, had to do in some way or another with the presence of United States forces on the island. Um, and that means, you know, the Marines, the Navy, the Army, all of the elements of the armed forces. Uh, and you can see in this particular screen, some of the people who have made um, careers in the military. And that includes actually one of my uncles. <laughs> uh, I had an uncle, um, Rafael, who in the United States became known as Ralph, um, who was a sergeant, uh, served in Korea where he received a bronze medal with the letter V for valor uh, during an engagement with enemy forces in that country. Um, uh, but these are some of the other names that we sometimes don't hear about when we um, think about Latinos uh, in, in the military. Uh, Jorge Farragut, uh, if you see, if you go to Washington DC, you take the Metro, you will probably see the Farragut train station. Uh, that was named after the Farragut son and father um, who established himself. Farragut was a Spaniard, the father was born uh, the son of Farago was born in the United States, became an admiral in the US Navy during the Civil War. And then the other names that I mentioned that I just give you a, a sense of some of those people, um, some of the ones who fought uh, with distinction in the military and left an imprint. Uh, Angela Salinas, for example, uh, she was probably Angela, uh, Salinas, I say Angela because I'm so used to using the English phonetics uh, for names like Angela. But she was the first Latina Brigadier General of the US uh, Marine Corps. Horacio Rivera from Puerto Rico, four star Admiral, Supreme NATO Commander. Uh, Juan Valdez, Master Sergeant, uh, the last Latino or the last US soldier to leave Vietnam after the withdrawal of US forces there. And then we had Second Lieutenant Emily Perez, Afro-Hispanic, the first female West Point graduate to lose her life in Iraq. Awarded a multiple distinction that you see listed there. And this is the picture that I in accidentally brought up earlier, but it'll give you a visual representation of who she was. 
there are many, many people like this in the US Armed Forces that we sometimes do not recognize or do not know about. And for that reason, I think a lot of people don't give Latinos as much credit for the contribution to the society here than they deserve. Uh, Latinos have also been involved in both the TV industry and the silver screen. In the silent movie industry, and more recently in videos and DVDs that are being put out constantly by Hollywood and other um, companies that produce these um, cinematographic and, and, and uh, programming. And the faces of these people are sometimes obscured by the fact that we don't know them. So when we see them on the TV, we sort of take them for granted that they're there. And But when we look back and start tabulating them, we begin to see that they played an enormous uh, role um, in, in our society. Rita Hayworth, Raquel Welch. When I grew up, by the way, uh, I grew up in the United States. I came to the United States in 1967. When I mean the United States, I mean continental United States. In 1967, I was 13 years old. I did not know any English because it was not used in Puerto Rico. My sister knew two words, uh, beautiful and yes. And she felt that she had conquered the world. <laughs> you know, she said, I'm going to fit in. I know these two words. I got it. I'm going to represent us. Um, but when I grew up, I remember listening about and hearing about Raquel Welch, and I saw on the t on the movie industry in the films, and I said, wow, what an American. <laughs> now that I went through college, I got an education, I'm beginning to find that a lot of these stars that we were watching on the TV, some of them were Latinos. Um, Raquel Welch was one of them. Anthony Quinn, Jose Ferrer, um, Rita Moreno, uh, in that movie, West Side Story. Even the Oscar was modeled after a Mexican actor, Emilio Fernandez. Carmen Miranda was Luso Brazilian. Um, does that qualify her as Latina? Eh, yes, because um, uh, Spain was part of the, um, um, not only the, the world of Islam, but before that, Spain was part of the Roman Empire and Latin was used in Spain throughout, even during the colonial encounter in the Americas, Latin continued to be used. Uh, and Portugal, which to the independent nation was then part of Spain until about 1640 when it became independent. Um, Jimmy Smith uh, that you see in a lot of police action movies, uh, Surinamese, Surina Mis and Puerto Rican, Antonio Fargas, Puerto Rican and Trinidadian. You'll see a couple of pictures in a minute to put a face to the names. Sammy Davis Jr., African-American and Cuban. Desi Arnaz, everybody knows he's Cuban, right? He's got the bongo, uh, in which he used to sing this religious song from uh, West Africa called Babalu. Uh, Babalu in Afro-Cuban Santeria, which is a, a form of religion in the, on that island, is a, the interpreter of, of the gods or goddesses of West Africa. And so um, it has a very important role in that culture. But in the 40s and 50s, when uh, Desi Arnaz was singing Babalu, people did not know that. All they did was they heard the sound, they heard the drumming, and they liked it. I liked it. Um, Ricardo Montalban, very famous. And here is Carmen Miranda. Um, what distinguishes her the most is this headdress with the flowers and fruits on top of it. And uh, she made a lot of movies in, during her time. 
And this is Antonio Fargas, uh, another character that we saw constantly in, in, on TV growing up. I didn't know at that time when I was seeing him back in the 60s and 70s that he was Hispanic. I learned that when I went to college. That's another facet of many Hispanic lives in the United States. And that is that just like I went to college and studied, um, there were many people, and there are still many people in the United States who do not know their historical background in Latin America or even individuals of Latino descent in the United States who are Latino because it was not provided in the, in the school systems. Uh, there was a time when cultural diversity and multiculturalism was not big. Uh, and so it has only been in the post 1960s where you begin to see a lot of these changes and people getting an education and learning about some of this information. And here's a picture of um, Sammy Davis Jr. with her, his father and, her, and his mother, Elvera Sanchez. At one point on the uh, internet, they even suggested that she was of Puerto Rican descent. And then I learned since then that, that she was of Cuban descent. So the reason people confuse Cubans and Puerto Ricans is because Cuban Puerto Rico has a very strong connection. And I'll try to elaborate on that a little later on so you can see the connection between Cuba and Puerto Rico. Latinos have always participated in, in other areas of the US society, especially sports. Uh, you see them in, in many areas. Um, of course, we often hear of oh, Latinos in boxing, um, we hear in baseball, but we don't hear in the other areas. So I just wanna show some of the other areas along with boxing and, and baseball where Latinos have been prominently uh, featured. Um, here you see uh, Juan Chichi Rodriguez uh, in golf, Nancy Lopez, Gigi Fernandez in tennis, Carmelo Anthony, my son loves this guy, uh, Afro-Puerto Rican NBA player who after uh, Katrina, not Katrina, after Maria destroyed Puerto Rico in 2017, he literally wiped out the island. I believe that Carmelo Anthony uh, went to the island and helped with the recovery effort, uh, particularly by helping in the fixing and repairs and the establishment of new baseball fields, among other things that he did there. Ted William in baseball, a, fa a very famous Mexican-American, Tony Romo with the Dallas Cowboys, and of course Tito Trinidad in boxing. These are just some of the names that are there that we don't often look at, remember, or even discuss because we take them for granted and, and also because some people simply do not know. And so therefore they are not aware of it. I have made it a point of educating myself on this, even though technically I'm a historian of Latin America for the colonial era, right? I'm supposed to know things about, you know, from the arrival of Columbus to about the independence era, the colonial era, but I enjoy myself branching out and trying to understand not only the historical development of the United States, but the place of other ethnic and racial groups within it, just for my own learning. Uh, Hispanics have also participated in the science and technology fields. Uh, of course, as you might imagine, given that Latinos are newcomers in the educational pipeline, Remember that the EOP program, the Equal Opportunity Program was created in 1967. So the entrance of Latinos in colleges and universities pretty much dates from that era in terms of large numbers. 
Yes, there were people before that who went to college, but in terms of mass numbers, it's a post-1967 phenomenon. Uh, I started college in 1974. I started with a GED. That's all I had. I quit school because I was being mocked for my accent. Um, I couldn't speak English correctly. And so I felt that I did not fit in. So I left school to join gangs. I'm not proud of that, but that's what happened. Um, and after spending many years, um, essentially wasting my lives, I decided to turn around. I got a GED, a high school equivalency diploma in 1974, which I still have. I still had the diploma. And I went to college. I graduated with honors in 1979 went on to my master's degree, finished it in 1982, and went on to the PhD, which I finished in 1994. All of these steps I uh, would not have done without the help of a lot of people. So it wasn't something that, you know, magically I was able to go through the educational pipeline and come out at the end a successful professional. There was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of loans, and a lot of people who stood by me and said, I believe in you, let me help you. We're gonna help you, you're gonna make, you're gonna get through. And I did it. Um, but there are a lot of people that wanna participate in technology, in STEM field, science, technology, mathematics, and engineering, but they don't have the quantitative skills for that because in some of the, um, you know, underfunded school districts in the United States, uh, some enrichment programs and special programs of enriching students in the sciences are not offered, uh, and consequently, students go to college unprepared. And but nevertheless, there has been an effort lately to push more students in that area. This is something that I tried to do at Wayne State as the director of the Center for Latino, Latina and Latin American Studies, try to get more students to become interested in and successful in majoring in any field, but particularly those that are hard to, uh, for them to enter into. And for many other students, not just Latinos, um, it, it's a challenging field, right? Uh, but here are some of the people who have made it an impact in the areas of science and technology um, in the more modern days. If you go back to the days of the pre-Hispanic era, um, it is surprising to me, but I learned this in college, that the Incas were already practicing brain surgery, you know, um, before the Europeans ever came to the new world. They were already in Mexico developing pharmacology before the Europeans set foot in Mexico. Uh, in the Caribbean, some of the Native Americans were already developing anesthetics um, and developing rubber or depend, developing other products before modern technology. Uh, rediscover them and produce them at a mass scale. So there had been many Latinos involved in chemistry, in, in physics, in biology, in botany, um, in astronomy, uh, in the engineering field. And here are just the, some of the names uh, of the people that are in those areas. Um, using this information in the classroom, is very, very valuable because these are role models that will cause students to think of themselves as wanting to follow on the footsteps of some of these individuals. By the way, that's what I did. Uh, when I was in, before I dropped out of school in 1971, I had a great Mexican teacher who was my science teacher and he helped me develop a microscope. I'm sorry, he actually, showed me how to use a microscope, but he helped me build a telescope 
and a telegraph. And I used them both uh, when I was 14, 15, 16 years old until, you know, unfortunately I dropped out of school and, and took a different path. But before that, I was very much interested in the sciences and I'm still am. Even as a historian today, I love the Discovery Channel programming on science and, and nature shows and so on, because a lot of that is something that what I learned in junior high school and, and I still am fascinated by it. Just as some of these people that you see on this screen were when they got involved in those areas. Latinos, of course, as I mentioned before, are making major strides in the educational arena, but they still are underrepresented there. Um, when you look at the proportion of Latinos with a high school diploma, it's not very high. The proportion of Latinos with a bachelor's degree continues to lag behind those proportions from other ethnic groups. Um, so there's still a, a lot more work to be done before we can get a proportional representation of Latinos in the universities and colleges. But nevertheless, there's been a lot of uh, advances. Uh, and in my job, I went to Part of my job is to help recruit students in the community, get them to come to Wayne State, and then provide the scaffolding type of support that would enable them to, you know, acquire the competencies and the skill sets that they need in order to make it in a rigorous institution such as Wayne State University. And here is that increment that I was referring to. Um, there has been from 1980 to about 2020, there's been a good, you know, increase in the numbers of Latinos and Latinas getting a college degree. And this is good not only for Latinos and Latinas, it's actually good for the U.S. economy, uh, especially when you consider that by the year 2050, Latinos are expected to become 25% of the U.S population. That's 25% that if uneducated or if lacking training and expertise in those difficult STEM fields and other areas, that's 20% of the population that's not going to contribute a whole lot, right? And so we can continue in many areas of the economy, right? In industry, in manufacturing, in business, but we also need people in technology and mathematics and science. And so that's what I was referring to. So the more Latinos with a college education, the better off the country will be. Um, so this is something that will impact all of us, not just Latinos. It's basically self-interest that dictates the need to increase the level of Latino participation in higher education. Uh, one of the earliest uh, persons to actually pursue education or to embrace education was Arturo Alfonso Schoenberg. Um, when I was in college and I first heard his name, I said to myself, who was this German guy? <laughs> Uh, and then I went back to the books and I learned more about him. And he, of course, was a Puerto Rican who was born in uh, 1874, um, the year after the abolition of slavery in Puerto Rico. He was a mulatto, meaning that his mother was black and the father was German. So he was a mixed racial mixed race individual. Um, he came to the United States around the 1890s uh, during a time when the Cuban um, movement for independence was 
bubbling up in the United States. It had already been significant on the island, but some of the exile decided to relocate to the United States where they could plan for the movement to be successful, where they started raising money and raising consciousness about the need to free Cuba. So Schomburg came to the United States around that time and became involved in that movement. When that movement ended after the United States and Spain had that war of 1898, he decided to spend his time gathering materials on the Black experience in the United States. He got a job in it and and began to send text messages <laughs> in a telegraph to people letting them know, if you have materials on the Black experience, I would love to trade with you. And so from the 1900s all the way to 1936, he assembled this collection of artifacts, mostly books and manuscripts and journals and uh, travel accounts and magazines and photographs. And they were uh, purchased by the New York Public Library and it became the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Um, and this is uh, who he was. He became the president of the American Negro Academy in 1920, 1928. Um, and he was credited with, among other things, uh, the start of Black studies as we know it today. If you look at this passage, it's pretty, you know, representative of the type of thinking that was being this that was being or that prevailed, as you say, during the early 1900s, when Booker T. Washington on the one side and W. E. B. Du Bois on the other side were debating the future of Black America. And here comes this Puerto Rican and said, "Well, let me take a stab at it too." And 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 so he was instrumental in calling attention to the need for education and the need for people to get away from what occurred to them historically in the United States through segregation, discrimination, and so on, and to chart a new future for African-Americans where they could feel engaged and participating in, in, in the development of this country. So that was Arturo Chamber, but notice that he called himself Arthur. That's because like my uncle, Rafael, you know, when you go to the United States, they, they call you like that. Um, they call you the closest name to your Spanish sounding name. So when I was growing up in New York City, my nickname was Georgie. It was only when I went to college that I realized that it was Jorge and said, mm, I need to appropriate my name. But anyway, Latinos have always participated. Dr. Chine, I, I hate to, I don't want to be the burden, uh, the, the bad news, but we're, I have to be a timekeeper for us today. And okay. I, I want to let you know we're, we're at time. Uh, so I don't know if, if it would, would be me, appropriate to make, yep, a, a couple final mo moments. Yeah, let me just. And we'll have to move on. Yes, thank you. Yeah, let me wrap it up because I realized that I spent a little bit more time. But here in 1947, one of the very first cases on segregation in schools took place and it was called the Mendes versus uh, Westminster School District in California in 1947. This is the case that predated the Brown versus Board of Education and in which Latinos played a decisive role in bringing about social change on behalf of this particular population. Um, the, this case had to do with a little girl, uh, Sylvia Mendez, who, could not, who was not allowed to go to a school because she was dark-skinned. And the school said that dark-skinned kids were not allowed in that particular school. So the parents sued to try to get the daughter to go to the school. Eventually, they won. The daughter became an adult and eventually received a Medal of Freedom from President Obama in 2011. Um, and so that's my take right there. Um, there's more information about, you know, modern day uh, statistics on Latinos in the following screens. I mentioned that I was gonna make that connection between Puerto Ricans and Cubans. And my only comment on that is 
that the flag of Cuba and Puerto Rico, the national flag of Cuba and Puerto Rico was designed in the United States, in New York in particular, and they reversed the color. So both islands had the same flag with, with the reverse colors that I would show you momentarily. This is the flag of Puerto Rico on the left side of that picture. You see the triangle with the star in the middle. And then the one, two, three, four, five rows, right? Now the Cuban flag. Same flag. The colors are reversed. Anyway, well, thank you for having me here, Scott. It's been a pleasure, Reina and Dr. Rice. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed the uh, participating in this program. If anyone needs more information, please um, don't hesitate to contact me at my email, jchinea.wenda.edu, and I'll be more than happy to uh, elaborate on anything else that you would like to know about. Well, we thank you, Dr. Chinea, for this, this amazing knowledge that you're sharing with us. It, it's extremely important in our effort in helping our educators teach a comprehensive history in our classrooms. So we thank you for your time and your, your expertise. Uh, so I, yeah, so for everybody else, uh, thanks so much for attending. Uh, our next webinar is a, this of course is a three-part series. We have two more to go, uh, titled Labor Rights Movement. We continue on May 17th and May 24th from four to 5 p.m. Uh, please register if you haven't. Remember each webinar is unique. Uh, so please, please, please continue your attendance. If you are interested in sharing your ideas to support future planning of the Teaching Comprehensive History Initiative, please use the additional link or the link that's already been added uh, to fill out the survey and even attend uh, a open comment, a listen and learn session uh, with our team, the Teaching Comprehensive History team. We'd, we'd love to hear from you and, and work with you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, also, uh, questions uh, that have been asked, uh, we will take those uh, and email you uh, as soon as possible and or wrap it into our next presentation to address the questions as well. Um, so we really appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, please take a few moments left to grab any links that you might need for your sketch application and or the survey that's in there. You will receive a feedback form via email. Uh, following uh, the close of this webinar. Thanks again, Dr. Chinea, and thanks all My for pleasure. Attending, attending today. So a few moments in time uh, to grab that um, here.